All right, so I think while everyone gets settled, I'm going to go ahead and get started with a few introductions. Um, for those of you who um, don't know me yet, my name is Emily Prince. I am a 2L here at Tulane Law. Um, I'm also chairing this year's summit. Um, so thank you, everyone, for attending this panel. Um, I would also like to thank the, Mar the Tulane Maritime Law Center for sponsoring this. Um, so, our, we have three panelists with us this afternoon. Um, Audra Parker is President and CEO of the Alliance to Protect the Nantucket Sound. Um, the Alliance to Protect the Nantucket Sound is a nonprofit environmental organization dedicated to the long term protection of the Nantucket Sound off the coast of Massachusetts. Audra holds a Master's of Science in Management from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, and a Bachelor's of Science in Applied Mathematics and Economics from Brown University. Our next speaker is David Sharp. He is a shareholder with, I don't want to, can you tell me the name of your firm? I know I'm going to butcher it. Lugan Buell, Wheaton, Peck, Rankin, and Hubbard. Uh, he is also an adjunct professor here at Tulane University Law School. Uh, he's a New Orleans-based maritime attorney whose law practice is focused upon indemnity and risk management in the offshore marine service and energy sectors. His work includes negotiating and litigating charter parties and towage agreements for both owners and charterers. David is also, also an adjunct professor at Tulane Law School, where for many years he has taught an upper-level course called Towage and Offshore Services. David holds a degree in electrical engineering from Tulane University and received his JD from George Washington University Law School. Finally, Robin Maine is a partner with Hinkley Allen. Her practice is focused on in the areas of commercial litigation and environmental law. She's responsible for legal for legal counsel, I'm sorry, and guidance to the firm's clients on a broad spectrum of environmental matters, including compliance, permitting, property damage, and cost recovery. She received her JD from Tulane University Law School and a BA from the University of New Hampshire. Please join me in welcoming today's panels. I guess that's my cue. Hi, I'm Audra Parker, and I'm the president of the Alliance to Protect Nantucket Sound. And I'll tell you a little bit about um, who we are and what we're trying to protect. So we're a nonprofit environmental group, and we're dedicated to long-term protection of Nantucket Sound. We were formed back in 2002 in response to a proposal by a private developer called Cape Wind, who wanted to construct a big offshore wind farm in the middle of Nantucket Sound, off the coast of Massachusetts between Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket. We're an alliance of thousands of supporters, Cape and Islands residents, commercial fishermen, recreational fishermen, tribal members, chambers of commerce, and other stakeholders that are concerned about the impacts of this project in its particular site. So as an, an organization, we support renewable energy, but provided it's responsibly cited it has community support, and it's cost-effective. And this particular project meets none of that criteria. And our long-term mission is designating Nantucket Sound as some sort of marine protected area like a National Marine Sanctuary, and I'll, I'll touch on that as well. So what is Nantucket Sound? You see it's that body of water that lies south of Cape Cod, between Cape Cod Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket. Perhaps some of you have, have been to this area. It's a big tourist destination. Um, it's a significant habitat for a variety of species, threatened and endangered species, birds, marine mammals, sea turtles. Um, it's an odd jurisdiction. It's split between federal and state waters, so that blue area that looks kind of like a fish is federal waters or outer continental shelf in the center of Nantucket Sound. The area from the land out three miles around it is state waters and is actually protected under the Massachusetts Ocean Sanctuaries Act. Um, in 1980, the state or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts had nominated the sound for designation as a national marine sanctuary. It got put on the inventory list, which was called the site evaluation list, and then eventually that program was put on hold. It has now been restarted just as of last year under NOAA. Um, and in 10, 2010, 
during the consultation process under the National Historic Preservation Act, Nantucket Sound was deemed eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places because of its significance to the tribes that live on, the, it's called the Wampanoag Tribe on Cape Cod in a town called Mashpee and also on Martha's Vineyard. is not working anymore. Pull the keyboard. That works. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so I, I'll go a little bit into what Cape Wind is, and then it's important to understand the process. I think it might um, give a good contrast to what Robin's going to talk about later in Rhode Island. But Cape Wind was proposed back in 2001. Um, it's a massive project. It, it's 130 wind turbines that would cover 25 square miles. That's about the size of Manhattan. Each of the turbines would be 440 feet tall, so a 40-story skyscraper. So it's a massive industrial project. But at the time it was proposed, there was no legal authority to use federal waters of the Outer Continental Shelf for offshore wind. Um, it was the permitting or the regulatory process def defaulted at that point to the Army Corps of Engineers, and it wasn't until 2005, with the passage of the Energy Policy Act, that leasing authority was established for re offshore renewable energy in federal waters, giving the Department of Interior um, the lead status. It also, the Energy Policy Act, also required regulations to be put in place within nine months, and it actually took about four years. So in the process, Cape Wind and one other project off of Long Island were grandfathered into the process. They did not have to go through any kind of competitive bidding. And the location itself was picked by the developer. And this is the key thing. The location in the center of Nantucket Sound was picked because technically it was a great location. The winds were strong. It was protected by the Cape and the islands. And it was close, close to shore, so it limited the distance of the transmission grid. There was no consideration given to the public interest, given to public interest values like, is this an essential fish habitat? Is this a migratory bird flyway? Is this an area that's used by, um, you know, for navigational purposes, et cetera, et cetera. So in 2010, partly because of the controversy surrounding Cape Wind, the federal government launched a program called Smart from the Start, which is actually um, a form of ocean zoning overlaying the technical criteria that a developer would need to build a project, but overlaying it with public interest values, overlaying it with um, you know, fisheries issues, navigational issues, um, sensitivity to, of marine mammals, etc. And the yellow or gold in the right top corner there, that's the Cape Wind footprint, again, in the center of Nantucket Sound. Um, the green area is a wind energy area off of Massachusetts that was part of the Smart from the Start initiative that actually just went to auction at the end of January and again was subject to a competitive bidding process. So, so it's important to understand why Cape Wind has been so controversial. It preceded all of this zoning. It preceded the regulations. It was a developer that was trying to pioneer a project, but again, it ended up leading to a great deal of opposition because what made it attractive technically made it very conflicted from a stakeholder perspective. So I can't even do this now. Clearly, this is not my forte. Oh, wait, I got it. Thank you. Um, okay, so what are some of the problems with Cape Wind? And I'll go into, um, show you some, some charts here, but everything from the aesthetic impacts, and it's not just that, it's not just a NIMBY issue as the developer likes to portray. It goes beyond that. There's danger to air and sea travel, um, desecration of tribal lands, threat of an oil spill, and I'll go into these in a, in a little bit of detail. So this is a, um, a visual simulation from an area on Cape Cod that's a distance of about five miles showing the 130 turbines. So, you know, highly visible. These structures are so big that you would see them about 20 miles away. Um, and this is a daytime visual. At night, the 58 perimeter turbines would be lit with flashing lights that would flash on for a second, off for two, on for a second, off for two in unison. And this is an area, again, it's a, we don't even really have big box stores. It's not a, I mean, it's more developed than it was, say, in the 50s, but it's not a highly developed area. It's very incongruous with the area, and the reason people come to the Cape and Islands is for the unspoiled beauty. 
one of the things that really changed the opposition increased the opposition was for years the developer was saying that it was going to be cheap and green and in two thousand and ten nine years after the project was first proposed they were able to secure contracts to sell their power they're called power purchase agreements and they were able to secure them because there was um, a big political factor pushing this project both at the federal administration and the state level um, were were very um, interested in promoting offshore wind, having Massachusetts be the first state in the country with an offshore wind project. So they got a lot of help. There was special legislation put in place that basically allowed Cape Wind to secure these above market contracts. So the a land based wind project, for example, contracts are coming in about eight cents per kilowatt hour. That's the blue line that's flat across the bottom, flat over time. Market prices vary. That reflects a mix of renewable fossil fuel, everything um, primarily set by natural gas in, in New England. You know, 10, 12 cents varies. The Cape Wind contract started at about 20 cents per kilowatt hour with a guaranteed 3.5% increase, bringing it to over you know, 35 cents in the final year. So that differential represents $3 billion to Massachusetts ratepayers. So businesses got really up in arms once they knew that this project was actually going to be high cost, not, not at low cost. Um, this is just some ads that business community um, <coughs> ran that basically say things like uh, Cape Wind would make Massachusetts less competitive. Those increased costs would actually lead to decreased jobs or other ways of offsetting those high costs. So the business community got behind the opposition to this project. Um, on the navigational safety issue, the, the grid there is the project. That is the project footprint. And the, the red and green lines that are adjacent to it, that triangle pattern, those are shipping and navigation lanes. So a lot of traffic, particularly concentrated in the summer months, because right now it's zero degrees and we have four feet of snow. Everyone comes to the Cape in you know, July and August, pretty much. So you have a great deal of traffic. Um, Three million people go by ferry alone between the Cape and the island. So it's very concentrated, very highly variable weather. And this project would be dangerously close to those shipping and navigation lanes. Another example is now there's standards where there's safe separation, about a mile and a half required between a turbine and a shipping lane. Here on the main channel, the, the horizontal line, it's less than a quarter mile. That means a slow going vessel, a vessel going about 12 knots, would have something like 30 to 60 seconds of reaction time in the case of a mechanical failure before potentially colliding or alighting with a turbine. So the standards that are being put in place now in those wind energy areas are requiring buffer zones that did not happen here. Um, the other thing is that the spinning blades actually interfere with marine radar. So you've got a place with 200 days of fog per year, a lot of traffic, a lot of fishery, fishermen, recreational, commercial, a lot of boaters, ferry traffic, and putting this 25 square mile project in the center of this has been described by, for example, one of the ferry operators as an accident waiting to happen. So that's one of the, one of the conflicts. Similarly, air traffic, same thing. Spinning blades interfere with air traffic control. And this is one day of um, flights over Nantucket Sound, again, in a summer day. So next to Logan Airport in Boston, Barnstable and Nantucket are the second and third busiest airports. Um, on the tribal issue, I mentioned we've got um, Wampanoag tribes. Wampanoag means people of the first light. An unobstructed view of the sunrise is integral to their religious and cultural property practices, um, as well as the area where the project is targeted on Horseshoe Shoal was once dry land um, where they basically lived, buried their ancestors, so they're very upset about basically a private developer putting in 130 massive wind turbines into their ancient burial grounds. Um, and that the um, Advisory Council on Historic um, Preservation, which was one of the federal agencies involved, actually recommended that the project be denied or relocated. And our group kept trying to get the developer to relocate to a less conflicted site. So I, I mentioned that um, to say that you know there were alternatives even at the time that the developer could have moved to. He was not interested. So the fight goes on. Um, environmental impacts, commercial fishing, recreational fishing, um, harms to birds including endangered species like piping plovers and roseate terns, harm to sea turtles, and this structure um, would also be part of the project. It's called an uh, electrical service platform. It would hold 40,000 gallons of oil essentially in the middle of our fishing grounds in the middle of Nantucket Sound and against the public that would bear the risk of an oil spill. 
So where is the project? So we've been fighting it for 14 years. It's been an extremely long battle, and we've had some, from our perspective, some great news in the last couple of months. Those contracts that the state facilitated, arm-twisted, you could say, um, to for Cape Wind were terminated, were canceled on um, January 1st of this year because Cape Wind failed to meet critical milestones that were in the contracts. They are still contesting the termination, um, but the utilities have both canceled their contracts. They were unable to get full financing for their $2.6 billion project. We have a number of legal challenges that, that I will get into, but right now they maintain a lease that they got through the Department of Interior back in 2010. They haven't approved what's called COP or Construction Operating Plan, which gives them the authority to build, but they don't have the ability to build because they don't have any customers and they don't have the money to build. So right now, the project is in um, very serious trouble. So legal challenges, I'm probably the only non-lawyer or non-law student <laughs> explaining to you all what we're doing for um, legal challenges. So forgive me if I messed up here. But um, So we have right now um, three live cases pending. There's been a lot of litigation over the years with this project. The first case is our organization, the town of Barnstable, which is on Cape Cod and some local businesses and residents that pay electrical bills. And we have been contesting the NSTAR contract because what happened, the state, so the first utility, after the state um, established this law, the first utility bought 50% of Cape Wind's power in one of those long-term contracts that I showed you. The second utility, and there's only two big ones in Massachusetts, didn't want to buy it. So at one point soon after, they wanted to merge with a utility out of Connecticut, and the state found its leverage. The state said, fine, we get to approve this merger, and if you all buy power from Cape Wind, we'll make that a condition of approving the merger. And so that's exactly what happened. And when they did that, they had to buy it under the same terms and conditions as their first contract. So our lawsuit basically challenges that the state exceeded its authority in setting price, that that's the sole jurisdiction of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So that's our, that's our first lawsuit, and we were in oral arguments before the U.S. Court of Appeals in Boston on January 5th, and Star canceled their contracts on January 6th, notified the court on January 7th that the case should be dismissed because the contract's no longer valid. Cape Wind's still challenging that, so um, the court has asked for a status update in March, so we're not clear where that one stands. Second group of cases, or, or second group of plaintiffs, are challenging various federal agencies that have pretty much every federal agency other than the EPA that's been involved in the review of Cape Wind, ultimately with the goal of getting the contracts terminated. And then the last case is a, um, a state case that is um, being challenged by the, um, the, with the town of Barnesville as a plaintiff. Um, just very quickly, our long-term goal I mentioned is National Marine Sanctuary designation. This process has been restarted by NOAA um, back la last summer, so um, that we're trying to get some sort of designation that would protect traditional uses like fishing, but pre preclude Cape Wind or other inappropriate future industrial development. There's an article that's a handout um, that just ran the Boston Globe. The Boston Globe had historically been very much in favor of Cape Wind. The tide has turned. And I just wanted to read to you from a, a couple of quotes. Um, Cape Wind basically never won the lasting support of the people of the Cape and Islands, yet from the outside, Gordon, who's the president, has cloaked himself in environmental virtue and cast any and all critics as defenders of dirty energy. To doubt the merits of this particular project was to oppose renewable energy itself. To object to this specific site was to reject offshore wind power entirely. So the point being, it's just because it's green doesn't mean it's good. The devil's in the details. It's in the process, the way the site is determined, the way the project is formulated. So it's to oppose Cape Wind is not necessarily to oppose green energy. Um, final slide, because I know I have to wrap up. Just some observations. Cape Wind failed or is failing because it, it shows a poor location that had too many conflicts for the public and it's extremely expensive. The developer was unwilling to work with the community to consider alternative sites, divided the community, families, friends, I mean a very, very divisive, divisive issue locally. But the controversy led 
or help facilitate the establishment of ocean zoning at the federal level and establishment of standards. And just a quote from Interior Secretary Jewell, we learned lessons from watching what happened in Cape Wind. We deconflicted these zones to a large extent. That's talking about the new areas that are now being auctioned off through competitive bidding. So just um, going forward and using Cape Wind as, a, as an example of what not to do, successful offshore projects need to have responsible sites that are identified through some sort of a zoning process that considers the public side. They need to involve the community early on and throughout the, throughout the process to get public support, um, to rely on best science, not on a political agenda, which is basically green energy at any cost. And the ultimate issue is right now offshore wind is so expensive that the economics really don't work in the absence of very high rates and um, pretty extensive public subsidies at a federal at a federal level. So that's that's my story. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I really appreciated Audra's uh, initiation of this topic because I'm going to approach it from the developer side. Uh, I am an attorney for the developer of the wind farm off of Block Island, which isn't too far. Block Island's part of Rhode Island. It's not too far from the area that Audra was just talking to you about. And my project is called Deep Water Wind. And every time I mention deep water, people kind of like take aback. But this is Deep Water Wind, which is a uh, proposed 30 megawatt wind farm. And we believe at this point with what's going on with Cape Wind, we will be the first offshore wind farm in the United States. States. We're fully permitted and we anticipate starting construction this summer. Now it's a much smaller scale project than what you set, saw explained with Cape Wind. But what I want to do for the beginning of my presentation is take you back in time as to how deep water wind uh, perhaps, you know, in the tortoise and the hare type race, you know, kind of, you know, got in there and wound up hitting all the things that Audra in her last slide, which we couldn't have planned it better, kind of teed me up to say deep water wind is going to be successful because we do have an appropriate site. We engaged with the community, the economics work, and we did use the best science. In fact, if you look at the handout that I provided, it talks a lot about the best science. That handout kind of brags about the best science. So let me take you back in time. And I'm trying not to be too Rhode Island centric because we know it's the smallest state, but we've got 400 miles of coastline. We're hugely water dependent both with our current economy and with our history. Water and the preservation of our um, water environment is very important to us. But I don't want to get mired into anything that's Rhode Island centric. Rather, I want to talk to you about why we have been more successful in Rhode Island, surprisingly, because we're unsuccessful in many ways, but uh, very successful in how to handle our coastline. So going back many years ago, 1971, the state established the Rhode Island Coastal Resources Management Council. And while, believe me, there have been political agendas associated with that agency since its inception, it has done overall a pretty good job about mandating it or fulfilling its jurisdictional requirements, and that is to protect the coastline and the waters of Rhode Island. And so what, and I'll call it CRMC for short, what CRMC has done over the decades of its existence is to indeed zone the waters of Rhode Island. And this type of water-based zoning was really the first of its kind in the nation. And we could draw on a lot of good science, best science, because the University of Rhode Island, much like um, Woods Hole in Massachusetts and some other areas, have always had um, robust marine programs, sea grant programs, so they could really draw upon you know, excellent university help and others in the community. So CRMC started to zone waters decades ago, and they focused mainly on Narragansett Bay, which is um, an amazing estuary in Rhode Island, and said, you know, we're going to have, and I'll just give you by way of example, type one waters. Waters near, say, a salt marsh, where we don't want any industry, we don't want marinas, we really, we don't want docks. We're going to say this is, even for a residential dock, uh, prohibited because we want to maintain the pristine nature of that water. 
But then they looked around and said, well, Providence, the Port of Providence has been active since you know, the colonial period, as has the Port of Newport. And so that's going to have a different designation to support that rich commercial um, maritime culture, um, the sailing community in Newport, as I'm sure many of you have heard, is you know, truly one of the stellar ones in the world. So CRMC took these items into account and designated the water types so that they could be used to support our commerce, used to support our history, but at the same time be protective. So lo and behold, coming forward into the early to mid 2000s, um, the New England region, I think it's fair to say, was pushing forward uh, different legislation in the state general assemblies to mandate that the local utilities buy a certain percentage of their electricity from renewable sources. And so Rhode Island in particular passed a law in the mid-2000s mandating that utilities over a certain period of time work up to a decent percentage of their electricity coming from renewables. Now that could be wind, it could be solar, it could be otherwise. And so in order to jumpstart that type of need or to fulfill that mandate, the state put into effect a law that would allow for the review of power purchase agreements, much like what Audra was just talking about, to try to balance the sense of economies here. Because there's no doubt, and I don't want to get too political or controversial here, Audra and I, I think, could have a really interesting debate on uh, the economies of some of these projects. And, and frankly, being an attorney in a private firm representing a client, I also have to walk a certain line of you know, what I should and should not say. Um, but I think we can all agree, without a doubt, that the fossil fuel industry has had a 100-year-plus head start compared to the renewable energy industry. And so as a society, we need to make certain decisions as to what we're willing to invest in in order to look at moving away from fossil fuels, look at climate change, and look at different types of energy independence in the area. And so that discussion was a big discussion in New England about climate change, about energy independence, about what we can do because we have great natural resources. We have great wind. I mean, the America's Cup until we unfortunately lost it in the 80s was in Newport for a reason, because it's really good sailing up there. There's a lot of wind. And so what Rhode Island did was put in effect the mandate to say, you utilities, and actually in Rhode Island, we only have one major utility, National Grid, whereas Boston's got... N-Star. N-Star, yeah, yeah, the new yeah the new name, N-Grid. Um, and so the state said, you need to buy from renewables, and here's the criteria you're going to judge your contracts for buying that against. And so my client entered into um, a competitive and open process, wound up getting the power purchase agreement with National Grid, and my firm um, was embroiled in a lot of litigation over that because it certainly was challenged uh, and ultimately upheld by the Supreme Court as fulfilling the mandates of the law, including on the economic side. Now that's back um, a good six or seven years ago where all that started. While that was going on, the Coastal Resources Management Council said, you know, this project's going to be in Rhode Island waters, and it's going to be offshore, but we've never zoned the ocean because we never really had to. Who's going to put something up out off of Block Island, which is not close to, but it's in that same general area in the northeast of Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket that you saw, and it's in my handouts as well. So what CRMC did, and they were ahead of the feds. I mean, Audrey was just telling you about, you know, the feds said, holy mackerel, after Cape Wind, let's start zoning. Well, Rhode Island was ahead of the game and said, wait a minute, we know about zoning. We can do these special area plans is what they call them, and we're going to do that one for renewables in the ocean. And they weren't necessarily focused just on the deep water wind project, and they weren't in, even just focused on wind. They were focused on the fact that this is a tidal wave coming toward us, and we're going to have to be prepared with zoning. 
And so CRMC went to work, again, with a lot of great minds and a lot of best science and many stakeholders to look at how are we going to handle ocean zoning. And so they engaged not only with some of the best scientists around on the issue, they engaged with the tribes who Audra mentioned. They engaged with the Wampanoags and the Narragansetts who are more Rhode Island and a little bit of Connecticut centric. They engaged with the fishermen and not only the commercial fishermen but the recreational fishermen and the charter captains who take people out for fishing engagements on a recreational side. They also engaged with members of the community and I'm not being Pollyanna about this one. There are some people for, some people against, certainly in the community. And they also, over time, engage with various um, uh, environmental groups, Conservation Law Foundation, National Wildlife uh, Federation, and so on and so forth. The list of NGOs is, is endless. And after about a two-year process of meetings and going through an Administrative Procedures Act process for uh, putting together a set of regulations, CRMC came out with the first ever in the country zoning of the waters off of Rhode Island so that you could look at where could we have uh, certain types of development. And it's called the OSAMP, or o Ocean Special Area Management Plan. One of the interesting things about the OSAMP, and again, I, I just gave you one of the chapters of it, and it's humongous, but you can access it online very easily through <coughs> CRMC's website. What the OSAMP did, and I think it's extremely smart, and again, so different from what happened with Cape Wind, is that through this process that I just briefly explained with all these state, stakeholders and great minds, it was determined there is a renewable energy zone off of Block Island where because of various issues it is suitable for development and those issues include for example um, the types of benthic resources on the floor of the ocean are such that they don't support and I'm sure there are better minds in this room, I'm looking at the professor here, um, who can talk about this than I can. Uh, and I did have the, the wonderful experience of presenting experts on all these topics about a year ago, but you know, you kind of you, you work with your expert and you move on to the next one, but bear with me. The, the benthic resources in this area, the renewable energy zone, are such that they do not support the types of fish population that one would be concerned about with doing some development in the area. And it's a food chain type issue. So you don't have the benthic resources on the bottom of the ocean where the fish are really attracted to this particular area. Hence the birds aren't necessarily so attracted to this area either because the fish aren't there. So it was really a chain reaction in part in looking at this renewable energy zone the tribes, Wampanoags and Narragansetts, were very involved in going out um, on vessels and taking uh, core samples of the ocean floor to see if there were any, any evidence of ancient, prehistoric type civilizations there. And there weren't in that particular area. I mean, certainly, you know, New England is full of ancient Indian uh, impacts, but not in this particular area. Uh, we didn't have an issue with um, so much navigational traffic. We looked at, uh, the state looked at shipping channels. They looked at uh, typical recreational uh, use of the area and found that this particular area, after they indeed had studied about 1,500 square miles, kind of escaped the shipping channels. It escaped the hot areas to go sailing. It escaped the big fishing grounds because as I just described to you the benthic resources uh, were not as robust to support that. So the state did a decent job about saying, okay, in this particular area, the renewable energy zone, you've, you don't get a free pass, you don't get a green pass for putting in your development there, but surely it is a better area to look at for development than anything else. Um, those regulations were passed um, about four years ago now, and they were not um, challenged in court. So they are uh, 
in in stone now certainly declaratory judgments can always be taken but they're in stone now and it established an important regulatory uh, framework that the feds now and others uh, states in the area are looking at to establish um, some zoning in their areas so this is a way to potentially jumpstart at least the offshore wind industry in that new england area so i mentioned to you earlier that uh, deep water wind is a five turbine each tur uh, five turbine each one is six megawatt facility so it's much smaller than scale than what you saw with Cape Wind, dramatically smaller. And frankly, it is a pilot project. It is a pilot project called for by the legislation the state passed a number of years ago that I mentioned at the outset of my presentation. Um, Deep Water Wind had to go through much of the permitting process that you saw a little bit briefly described here. Um, that project is in state waters, the wind farm is. So it didn't have to go through um, every single element that Audra put on um, the screen. But it was, it's similar, and of course it had to go through the Coastal Resources Management Council process. What was interesting, and I was conducting those hearings actually a, a year ago right now, um, was that once we put on our case, and I put on the experts we needed and the other fact witnesses, the public then had an opportunity to get up and speak. And there were opponents and proponents, but what was interesting with deep water wind was that many of the proponents were the ones, or of the types of groups that were opposed to Cape Wind. For example, quite a few from the fishing community and representing um, coalitions and associations of fishermen in the area came up and spoke on behalf of the project because they had been in on the project from the inception. The project was very transparent. And so they understood between how the area was zoned and what um, Deep Water Wind wants to do that there would be you know, a certain amount of safeguards put in place. Um, I think overall, to, to sum it up, they, there was mutual respect in the process. Similarly with the Indians, um, one of the uh, leaders of the Narragansett tribe came in and spoke on behalf of the project. And what was also interesting was Conservation Law Foundation, um, the Providence Chamber of Commerce, uh, and many other groups who you never see aligned together, including um, some of the labor unions, all came in and spoke on behalf of the project because it was a stakeholder-rich and transparent project. One of the things that um, I think spurred Conservation Law Foundation to come in and speak on behalf of the project was that, to my knowledge, it is the first offshore project in the United States to enter into a treaty to not pile drive for the construction of the project during the migration of the North Atlantic right whale. So there were these types of things that the project took into consideration um, decided that, you know, what's the best course of action here and went with it and I think it was very valuable to the project. Once we got our um, CRMC approval, again, to put the wind farm in that renewable energy zone that I described to you, there was some subsequent litigation. And the litigation was interesting because it, it harkened back to earlier administrative um, proceedings that I had handled. And that was a few people, understandably, you know, ha had an opposition. You can't do a project like this and not have some opposition. Um, and the opposition was on the economics. The opposition was on visual impacts. Um, but what was interesting here was that the opposition was not able to state a particularized interest to give them standing that was different, that set them apart from the general public. And so those pieces of litigation didn't go anywhere for lack of standing in the court that the court said, you're just like everybody else in the general public, and so you can't have standing to come in and oppose the project because you're not particularized. And of course, the administrative agencies, whether it was CRMC or um, some at the federal level, had hit upon uh, the various issues that were raised by these opponents uh, to the project. And so at this point, uh, the project seems to be a go. Uh, it's fully permitted. 
Um, there are no other projects proposed yet in the renewable energy zone. So, you know, remain to be seen uh, what happens. I mean, Cape Wind certainly ran into a lot of issues that I think in some ways were very specific to Cape Wind um, and that other projects perhaps can learn from. I think that um, the regulators are kind of catching up to the industry right now by saying, well, wait a minute, you know, we do need to look at zoning of our oceans. We do need to look at how this will impact um, communities, fishing communities, et cetera. And so now that we've gone through kind of that rough ride in the, you know, earlier part of this uh, 2004 to 2015 timeframe, it'll be interesting to see if other developers come in. Um, you know, obviously with the whole gas industry right now, I'm not sure if there's that much of an appetite uh, to look at these types of developments, but the states certainly are pushing it, at least in the Northeast, and they're pushing renewables, and the laws are still on the books mandating that the utilities buy a certain percentage of their power from renewables. And in fact, Rhode Island, Massachusetts and Connecticut have just put out for comment an RFP or request for proposal that will also try to take a, a three-state approach to pushing forward renewables and helping with the infrastructure to support that because the infrastructure obviously is lacking. And that's perhaps one of the reasons why it makes it more expensive. But as I said earlier, the fossil fuel industry is well ahead of us on that curve by 100 plus years. They've got the infrastructure in place. They've got the improvements in place. The renewable industry, not so much. And in fact, I would say hardly at all. And so again, the question is, as a society, what are we willing to put up with from either expense or otherwise to push forward this industry and to make it a mo more robust industry uh, in our country and how that will affect all the things that you've been hearing about over the past two days on climate change. So thank you for your attention. To say that I have a tough act to follow would be a great understatement, I think. Uh, I'm David Sharp, a local maritime lawyer and part-time professor of towage and offshore service law here. The slide that's up uh, right now is the first page of a handout uh, that's in your materials. And it's just three pages of kind of some bullet point uh, ideas. What I think I'd like to talk about, and I'll try to tie it into what Audra and what Robin have talked about, is you know, what will happen when we do have a commercially functioning offshore wind farm? It, it, it seems uh, inevitable, um, for better or for worse. And is the maritime industry ready? And, and what are the challenges and some of the uh, uh, obstacles facing the commercial side of the service business, you know, actually getting these wind farms constructed, for example. And then once they're built, uh, how will they be serviced and by whom and are there special requirements? So I'll be talking a little bit about that and really just to see, you know, are, are U.S. companies and our maritime lawyers uh, ready for offshore uh, and our alternative energy? I think the answer is yes. A um, couple of things in, in my handout that I, I'd like to, to talk about. Uh, first of all, some of the regulatory aspects, and that are uh, if we're going to build wind farms um, offshore, they'll need to be serviced from time to time. These are, are generally something called a monopole construction, like a, a one giant single tower with a propeller at the top that's where the generator is and that's what creates the uh, creates the energy and those things have to be installed they've got to be maintained they've got to be serviced so uh, there's a question of getting people and equipment out to these work sites um, how will that happen and what kind of special equipment is required uh, the first point I make in my handout is that the Coast Guard has already kind of weighed in on what it views as a major regulatory concern, and that is uh, 
does the Coast Guard have jurisdiction over uh, wind farm support vessels, these vessels that will be out taking people and equipment back and forth between shore to the offshore sites? And the answer is yes. Um, I quote from a commandant's opinion issued in April 2011 uh, by uh, then Captain Steve Poulin, now Admiral Poulin, who will be down here in a few weeks speaking at the Tulane Admiralty Law Institute. Um, and he gave the opinion that the wind farm support vessel is an offshore support vessel within the meaning of the Coast Guard regulations. And that just means, uh, it's not terribly surprising or controversial, but it means the Coast Guard views uh, that it has jurisdiction over these vessels. It makes perfect sense. Um, I don't believe it's been challenged, but it's a very important step you know, to know, well, what, you know, who's going to be the regulatory agency? What were, were the alternatives? OSHA, maybe? Um, a state in, in state waters, maybe a state uh, safety and, and health uh, agency. Another question that comes up is what about the, where do these vessels, these wind farm support vessels need to be built? Um, and can they be built overseas where a great deal of these vessels are already being Built. Keep in mind that uh, the U.S. doesn't have any commercially operating offshore wind farms right now. Looks like deep water wind will be the first. But in Europe um, and, and to a lesser extent um, Asia and the, and the Pacific, there are functioning uh, commercially viable, although heavily subsidized, uh, I guess I should say maybe not viable commercially operational wind farms. So there are uh, vessels being built. And, and what's different about these? Well, uh, first of all, we have a very robust offshore service uh, vessel market here in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico and all over the world. Uh, it's one of the reasons that I teach a course in offshore service law. And this is primarily servicing the oil and gas industry. And we're just talking about waterborne transportation of people and stuff from land to these offshore sites uh, that are going farther and farther offshore um, to, to exploit the, the minerals below the seabed. So deeper and deeper water, um, farther and farther offshore, typically meaning bigger and bigger vessels to handle the wind and the waves and the transit times. It takes a long time to get from shore out to these offshore locations. So there's a very robust market for this kind of vessel, and we've got a lot of experience in allocating the risk of these ventures. And, and I talk a lot about this in my course, but what kind of risks do I mean? Well, we've, we've heard some from Audra and, and from Robin. I mean, uh, pollution risks. Um, collision risks, damage to the environment, uh, accidental damage, uh, and then more mundane uh, risks, if you will. They're very important, but people get hurt during uh, industrial work, um, and equipment gets damaged, and I'll show you a few slides that illustrate those points. So there's already a, a pretty robust, I suppose, infrastructure for building these vessels and owning them and financing them and leasing them. Uh, it's not at all unusual in the industrial market for vessels for a completely different party to, to own the vessels that actually ends up operating the vessels. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Well, one of the consequences of having a wind farm in state waters is that something called the Jones Act applies. Um, and you may have heard of that if you're a maritime lawyer. There are a couple of different flavors of the Jones Act. Um, you might have heard uh, Senator McCain making news lately about saying, let's repeal the Jones Act. Well, what does that mean? What he's talking about and the version I'm talking about is called cabotage law or coastwise trade law. And it's basically longstanding protectionist legislation. And I say that without any particular uh, uh, leaning either way that says that certain kinds of vessels and certain kinds of trades have to be built in American shipyards and crewed by American crewmen and uh, they have to be uh, flagged and manned uh, by Americans. So it's kind of a buy American, protect American. That's what I mean by the protectionism aspect. And it's pretty clear that these cabotage laws, including the Jones Act, apply uh, to wind farm service. And, and this is um, not a, a new 
conclusion that I've drawn, you'll see in my paper I, I cite probably the dean of this particular area, a fellow named Charlie Papavizas. I've cited a couple of his papers, and he's published in the Tulane Maritime Law Journal on this very subject about do these uh, trade laws govern um, the work between shore and an offshore wind farm? Does that count? Does it come within this, this penumbra? And, and the conclusion is, at least within state waters, like deep water wind, that unquestionably, yes. So what does that mean for the industry? Well, what it means for the industry is that vessels have to be built in American shipyards to serve these, uh, these wind farms, and they've got to be crewed by Americans for the most part, and they've got to be owned by mostly American companies, 75% for the most part. Um, so that's good news and bad news. The good news is, is that this can create jobs and work for American shipyards. Um, I suppose the, the only bad news is that it can be more expensive to build in, this, in the U.S. There's quite a lot of this capacity already in place overseas. So it's just one of those economic realities um, that the industry will be facing. But it's, um, it, it's something that lawyers uh, like you may get involved in, the regulatory schemes that, that drive these. Um, you might wonder, well, why can't we just use the American tonnage that's already at work in the, in the oil field, in the energy oil field? That's a good question. Um, as it turns out, the vessels that we use down here, especially in the Gulf of Mexico or in the North Sea, tend to be larger and heavier than the vessels that would be well-suited to work within wind farms, where the waters are shallower, and these monopoles are pretty delicate. I mean, they're very large, you know, 440 feet tall. Um, they're enormous, but they're also pretty, uh, pretty tender. They don't take a, a licking very well. So you actually are using smaller vessels um, than, uh, than we typically use in the uh, oil field. I'm going to show a few slides from a British company called South Boats. Um, this is not a client of mine, but this is a, an aerial view of an actual wind farm, um, I think, off the UK. And you can see that you know, they're spaced out in this grid, and, and you saw that from Audra's slides as well. So the, the vessels have to be of a size and configuration that can get out here and work among these towers. Uh, in fairly close proximity. Um, and what do they look like? Well, here's a, a, a pretty typical one. This is a computer animation. But you can see that it's a, a smallish uh, work boat. It's got kind of a little bit of a notch or, or a padded bow on the front so that it can nudge up against these towers without doing damage. And then people, like a mechanic or a service person, can get on and off uh, and climb up or, or however they get to the top of these great tall towers. Um, but they're smaller vessels. They tend to be of a catamaran type hull. Uh, so they've got a dual hull. Here's one, a brochure from another uh, English, English company, East Coast Charters, showing a vessel called the Topaz. And you can see the twin hulls, kind of a smallest shape. And, and these are rather small vessels, 15 meters, you know, 45, 50 feet long, whereas the offshore service vessels that are typically being built and used in the oil field industries now, maybe four or 500 feet, so maybe 10 times bigger. So you can see that those aren't really well suited for the kind of work uh, that's necessary. The catamaran hulls are intended to provide a more stable work platform in uh, sea conditions. Um, there's other types of hull configurations that are being explored, one called swath, which is a very low water plane area. But the idea is to create a stable platform for these men and women who are going to go out and, and service these things um, when they're actually put into construction. So uh, what about, um, you know, we, we, we've, suppose we've got a wind farm now and we've figured out where we're going to get the vessels and we've built them in the U.S. and figured out the right construction. Um, what, about, uh, what about contracts for chartering these vessels? Um, under maritime law, uh, the lease of a vessel is usually called a charter or a charter party. Um, and so I talk about charters is basically the, the rental contract that's used for a vessel. So what about uh, a, ch a charter contract? Have, is there a, uh, a body of law or practice or custom for renting these vessels? And the answer is yes, uh, there is. And here's an example uh, of, a, of a 
just such a contract. Uh, this is called Wind Time, which is short for the Standard Offshore Wind Farm Personnel Transfer and Support Vessel Charter Party. Uh, it's a mouthful. It's published by a company called BIMCO. Uh, it started as a trade organization um, in, uh, in the Scandinavia mostly for vessel owners, and historically, BIMCO has been kind of the trade group for deep water vessel owners. Um, so BIMCO represents the owners of tankers and, and blue water vessels, freighters, and that sort of thing. Um, but they, uh, over time, got involved with the uh, contracts that govern the, the rental or lease of oil field supply vessels. So within 25, 30 years ago, BIMCO saw a need for standardized model contracts that business people can use in the oil field uh, for oil and natural gas exploration. So BIMCO developed a, a contract that has a form called supply time. It's a, a time charter contract for supply vessels. So uh, that it was a good model. It's in its second or th the second revision. It's currently being revised again, and BIMCO then identified a need from its members for a contract that had specific terms for wind farm support vessels, hence the wind time contract. So the point I'm trying to make is we're ready for offshore wind. We've got, you know, the laws are mostly figured out here in the U.S. Uh, we've got shipyard capacity ready to go to build the vessels that'll take people out there, uh, and we've got contracts in place um, already, or at least model contracts that we can use. And these contracts allocate risk of things like collision damage and personal injury in much the same way that other oil field service industry contracts do. Um, you might have heard of knock for knock indemnity. Uh, you certainly have if you take my class. And it's just a form of risk allocation or risk reallocation where the owner and the renter, uh, called the charterer, agree to allocate and ensure certain risks of the venture so that they can be most commercially efficient, buy the right insurance without buying too much insurance. And, and, and reduce the costs of litigation when things go wrong, and sadly they do. Um, so we're trying to identify risks and allocate them using contracts, and that's what commercial lawyers do, whether they're on land or at sea, and it's no different uh, in the wind farm area, and will be no different. Um, it's just going to be a little bit unfamiliar maybe for a power company uh, or a u public utility that's building and operating a wind farm to go out and have to hire vessels. That may be a little, a little new for them, um, but, but the, the maritime lawyers will be ready. And of course, there's a whole body of special maritime laws that govern marine transportation and vessels and so forth. Um, well, in my remaining time, I thought I would show you just a couple of things uh, that, that can go wrong. Um, and, and this is, I think, you know, what both uh, Audra and Robin were alluding to. You know, well, you know what, we're going to be close to, to the shore. We're going to be accidents are bound to happen. I mean, sadly, that's, it, it's going to happen despite the, 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 the best minds. Um, you know, space shuttles, uh, uh, y you know, had disasters too. Well, here's a, uh, 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 an interesting slide showing some collision damage from a 20-meter vessel, about 60 feet, wind farm support catamaran, that evidently hit a wind farm monopole at 23 knots. That's a that's pretty good clip. Uh, that's north of, you know, getting close to 30 miles an hour. Um, I don't know if anyone was hurt. I can't imagine that somebody wasn't. Uh, but they're pretty proud of the fact that there was no damage uh, below the forward collision bulkhead and this thing could, could limp back into port. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that accidents do happen. These are age-old problems, and they're not just, you know, they're not just made up by uh, opponents of wind farms or proponents. Um, you know, these things will happen, so we have to be ready for them and ready for, or to, to address the safety issues and also to address uh, the allocation of risk and insurance. Um, I showed you the topaz a minute ago. This is actually a, a drawing, a, a photograph in better days. Um, sadly, the topaz is one of the first wind farm support vessel casualty case studies that we actually have. Um, this is a, uh, a, a rather unfortunate picture of the topaz uh, going down. 
and it caught fire. There was a construction defect. Somebody cut a corner when they were building this vessel or modifying it, and uh, there was an exhaust pipe that carried very hot uh, exhaust too close to a wooden part of the superstructure of the vessel, and the heat and the wood got together and formed combustion and caught fire. Uh, there were three crewmen aboard, evidently. None of them were hurt. They abandoned ship after they gave up the firefighting effort. Um, the, uh, the mayday was called. This happened uh, 11 nautical miles east of Lowestoft uh, in, off England, kind of off the Suffolk coast, more or less northeast of London. Um, so not in an area that's completely uh, uh, remote, you know, just like, like Nantucket, um, Barnstable, Boston, uh, Providence, and so forth. Um, there was, uh, so this is the kinds of things that can happen. There was a little bit of pollution when the vessel went down. Uh, there's obviously air pollution. There was a wreck that had to be uh, dealt with, marked, and removed. So these are, are kind of age-old problems in the modern context. Um, there's nothing unique about this particular casualty to wind farming. Um, it was a design defect in the vessel. Um, but, but these things are going to happen um, as we move into new forms of renewable energy. Uh, the last thing I'd like to mention just in, in the last couple of minutes is wind farms are not the only form of floating uh, offshore renewables that, that folks are looking into. Um, our panel is concerned with oceanic winds, um, but harnessing tides is another possibility. Is there a way to, to harness the natural mo motion of the tides or wave power? Um, and using kind of interesting floating structures out in the water to try to capture this mechanical motion, this kinetic energy, and, and convert it into electricity that can be used. Uh, interesting engineering challenge. Um, and, and it also raises some interesting issues under uh, US law especially about what is a vessel anyway. You know, but this is clearly a vessel, this poor topaz that sank. Um, but what about a, a fishing vessel or a supply vessel that's been converted into a mostly fixed uh, floating object that converts the up and down of the tides or wave motion into some sort of mechanical action that can be used to, to create energy? Um, what about a deep, deep water floating wind farm turbines um, uh, that, that might be uh, basically floating little islands that are, are moored in place. Uh, maybe they can rotate, maybe they can swivel. These are being examined for areas where the water's too deep to actually have a fixed foundation. Well, there's been a lot of experience in the offshore oil patch uh, with deeper and deeper exploration. It's a matter of time before floating turbine units get farther and farther offshore. Uh, it would solve one problem in terms of the, the eyesore value, you know, if you can get these things far enough offshore that, uh, that they're not seen. But that raises other, obviously, environmental and engineering challenges. Uh, but are those vessels? And how will banks lend money to the builders of those vessels? And how will uh, people, uh, what will happen if there are casualties involving them? So these are the kinds of uh, problems that maritime lawyers are kind of mapping out into the wind farm area. Uh, and we're ready for it, I think, when it comes. So uh, that's the end of my comments. Thank you very much. And I guess now we'll open it up for questions. Would you like to? I'm just going to turn the lights off. OK. Sure. Why don't I invite the, uh, my other panelists up, and uh, we can have a little Q&A now. Can you turn the, um, maybe let's switch this off, too. OK. I mean, especially not that picture, maybe a <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, I'm, I'm just thrilled to have uh, been invited, and uh, this is such a uh, a great opportunity. So we've got some questions. Let's have them. I really am impressed and I am thrilled to have wind as a separate focus. Uh, in addition to our solar focus, I mean, each year we get deeper in. And each year there's more experience on the panel, there's more experience with this. That said, it seems to me that a basic problem with wind on land 
has been this element of non-planning and planning by surprise. So you learned about the towers when they were leveling some trees someplace. It was all industry selected. Same thing with fracking. All industry selected. There's just no damn planning. Now I know you mentioned the possibility of zoning in offshore or at least in the water. What does that look like? Who's got the jurisdiction to zone? Uh, what are the criteria for zoning? Who's moving the zoning ball to avoid the Cape Wind kind of problem? Yeah, Professor Hauke, I'll address some of that. Um, in Rhode Island, the Coastal Resources Management Council, which is the agency vested with the jurisdiction to protect Rhode Island coastal waters, has indeed zoned through what's called an Ocean Special Area Management Plan, an area for the development of renewables. And because it's within state territorial waters, uh, within state territorial waters, they've been able and have the authority to do that zoning. And so they spent about two years with various stakeholders, scientists, uh, NGOs, fishing community, etc., to find what's called a <coughs> renewable energy zone. And that zone has been chosen because it met the criteria of having the least impacts on all these stakeholder groups. And while it's not a um, free pass to say, I'm a wind developer, I'm going to put my turbines right here, so just give me my permit and I'm out the door. It at least is a vetted area where you have a higher likelihood of minimizing impacts from the development, <coughs> frankly, getting a permit, but again, it's not a sure thing. Um, but they have taken that step, and Rhode Island was the first state in the country to do that. So that's state waters, and, right. and, and Cape Wind was going to be in an oxlet, at least partly, right, in, in well, federal waters. Purely in federal purely waters. Purely federal waters. In so. fact, the boundary between state and federal waters changed at one point, and they had to change their footprint. But okay. at the federal level, it's Department of Interior that launched the Smart from the Start initiative under Secretary Salazar, and it's the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management that's been leading that process. And my understanding is that they start with GIS maps where they're basically overlaying the technical criteria like wind speeds with you know, sensitive fish areas, that sort of thing, to, to identify areas <coughs> that may minimize some of the conflicts. And then they're holding a series of stakeholder meetings, and in many cases, as a result of the stakeholder input, they are excluding some of the original areas and ending up with smaller smaller areas called wind energy areas. And they're doing that up and down the coast. After they have those areas, they put out a request for interest to gauge if there's competitive interest in that. And then after some public comment and some period of time, they're actually going to auction and leasing those through competitive bidding. And that's happening now? That is happening. For example, in Massachusetts, January 29th, they, um, auctioned off 740,000 acres um, in four different zones. They had interest only in two of the four zones at this point. I mean, the difficulty with offshore wind is still the economics. Um, uh, they're not you know, self-sufficient. You need these high-priced contracts. You need federal loan guarantees, federal subsidies. So the, the um, lease areas are going at pretty you know, low dollar, two dollars an acre, pretty, pretty low bids <coughs> because the economics don't really work right, right just yet. And they can just sit on that. Yes, they have to do, I think they have five years to do a site assessment plan, but I think the, air, the idea is to kind of expedite the development while minimizing the conflicts, but I think there's a five-year period that they have to come up with a site assessment plan. Good, yeah. So that was, um, we had an avian expert who analyzed those issues, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife was also involved, as well as the state agencies. In that particular area, because of the lack of benthic resources, as I explained, and it being about 12 miles from the mainland and three miles offshore of the Block Island, there was not the migratory bird paths that you would see that would dominate the coastline. 
And so, again, for that reason, we didn't have, um, within this renewable energy zone, the impact on avian that one would expect if you were closer to the coastline, for example. So that was another plus for, let's zone this area because we've looked at migra migration paths in, in um, New England. In the, in the case of Cape Wind, it's in uh, the Atlantic Flyway, so there is, in fact, um, bird impacts. It's been one of the controversial areas. Um, there's two endangered species, piping plovers and roseate terns. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service had originally recommended a mitigation plan, which would basically be to shut the turbines down. It's called feathering, to basically stop them, stop the blades from rotating during certain migratory bird periods. Um, and this is actually was one of the one of the facets of our lawsuits because Cape Wind came back and said that that was not economically feasible for them that it would have you know x amount of revenue impacts they couldn't get financing so Fish and Wildlife Service basically abandoned that as a mitigation measure and so one of our lawsuits basically said that you know they they couldn't do that they couldn't defer. To, um, to the developer and the court actually remanded back to Fish and Wildlife Service to do an independent review of whether or not that that was a necessary mitigation measure. Um, one of the other issues was that the um, scientists at Fish and Wildlife Service early on had insisted on doing three years of baseline bird studies to understand what the population, what the habits were, and that was not done. Um, and in fact, one of the um, scientists that was at Fish and Wildlife Service got removed from his post because of his insistence on it and one of the plaintiffs in our lawsuits is public employees for environmental responsibility because they are conceivably protecting government employees who are insisting on science over some sort of political agenda. So there's definitely been an, you know, a, a pretty strong avian other wildlife impacts issues um, in, in the Cape Wind situation. If I could just add to this because it, something you just said reminded me of another thing that I find has been important with the establishment of this zone for renewable energy is that all the studies and time that went into it from, you know, even one thing I hadn't mentioned earlier, you know, looking for historic shipwrecks. I mean, all of that was really not analyzed in the level of detail it has been for this zoning. So another very positive impact coming from zoning the ocean waters is you have to know what's there from an environmental standpoint, from a cultural standpoint, from an historic standpoint. So this is really precedent setting in that there's never been this wealth of knowledge going into a regulatory <coughs> platform to zone the ocean waters. So we've really created an interesting body of information to work off of and a lot of data to work off of. Oh, please, go ahead. Um, from Deepwater Wind, provided that it goes well and it's successful and they get the turbines up, what is a long-term success besides being sort of landmark for the U.S. and the Inter Energy Board Island? What's, what sort of long-term success for them? Yeah, that's a good question. It's an interesting one. Um, I think it will start to push forward the mandate that the utilities in the area have you know, a certain percentage of the electricity supplied by renewables. I think that from a public perspective, um, there will be probably more acceptance um, of that type of energy, whether it's the cost or otherwise. You know, it's different. <coughs> People don't like change. So, you know, but once you implement that change, people then, you know, come around to it, or frankly, you learn from certain mistakes that may happen or say, I can do it better. So, you know, it's the ground floor, it's the evolution of a process. Um, I think that, you know, watching what's happened with Cape Wind and watching what has happened with deep water gives you two really good projects to compare to and say, what went right, what went wrong, where can we do better? And then, you know, we'll see what happens with the wind energy market. Um, there were leases off of, for lack of a better way to describe it, Long Island, uh, New York, about a year and a half ago. And Deep Water um, was the successful bidder on those leases. Uh, whether they're going to launch out and do a project there, time will tell. I mean, the project that, you know, we intend to start construction on in the summer is a pilot project. So we'll see if we go out to those Long Island leases that we're holding on to. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, Professor. Uh, I, we're on the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, half of all the migratory birds that fly come down to Mississippi Flyway and then go out over the Gulf. Um, they 
crash on the existing rigs every day. I mean, they're coming down to have a place to rest. They're, so whatever goes out in the Gulf is going to be a pattern uh, for these birds. And the birds that predate them. So we may have an unusual avian situation, or we may not. But I wonder whether the designation, are, are you familiar, is anyone in the room familiar with how the interior offshore designations, I assume these are area designations, zone designations? Yes. Anyone familiar with them in the Gulf? How far along they are, where they are? What for, assessment is? For offshore wind. For offshore wind. I think that at this point they've been basically um, mid-Atlantic states up through New England, mostly the that east the coast. Economic it's also where the wind is. Right. It's not really windy enough, it's, I'm told, yeah. down here right. to, to make it that attractive. But I'm not aware of any WEAs down here, but I, there may be yeah. something. No. Yeah, there aren't any. There yeah. have been all along the Atlantic states down to about uh, North Carolina. I've talked to a lot of our experts on, you know, why New England? Um, and they're like, by far and away, um, other than certain areas off the Oregon coast, which Deepwater Wind is also looking at, down south, it's not good. It's not economically feasible. The winds just don't exist for it. Hmm. Or there's too much. Yeah, at the wrong time, yeah. <laughs> or there's too much. Well, I don't, yeah. you know, too much is not actually a concern that they have. I mean, like, hurt. 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 Just, you know, there's no constant. Yeah. True. Yeah. I mean, what, what was interesting when we were going through all of our experts with the hearings is that these turbines, and they're, they're taking the pages out of the book of what's been learned in the North Sea over the years, these turbines can survive, it, it, and I don't understand the science with this, thousand year storms, you know, category four hurricanes, maybe category five hurricanes. So, you know, the, the experts will debate, you know, the... Um, you know, if you could put one in the Gulf because it was viable, they'll tell you it will survive, you know, Katrina and more. Yeah, we're told they can do deep water drilling, too. Yeah, <laughs> I, I understand. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, well, this is personal for me because I, I grew up near here, but uh, what sites in Massachusetts, are there any sites in Massachusetts waters that you think there could be a wind farm? Because you had kind of alluded to that while you were Yes, um, I can show and, you. And, and there is, well, I have no idea how to do that, but you can figure it out. Massachusetts has attempted to do this sort of planning as so, well. Right, Most but it, it, um, there is a state ocean plan, yeah. and actually Massachusetts state waters were protected under the Massachusetts Ocean Sanctuaries Act, which prohibited <laughs> any kind of electrical generation. Um, more recently, they have identified areas that could have small installations, you know, more in the five to ten smaller pods, nothing certainly the size of um, the size of Cape Wind, but um, oops. is this just going to keep going? The um, I'll show you the map of what was just auctioned as alternative sites. Okay, so this so you have the Cape up top there, the yeah. two islands, and that's the Cape Wind footprint, yeah. the gold. So this whole area federal in federal waters, exactly, was just auctioned off. But you see it's um, you know, it's probably 12 to 14 miles due south yeah, of Martha's Vineyard. And hmm. the further blocks were not did not have any takers in the competitive bidding. The closer ones did. But nothing in Massachusetts state waters, I doubt it will happen. Um, you know, again, you've got some economies of scale, so I think if you could go out further out to these areas that have fewer impacts that are identified through that, that zoning process and you could do larger scale, maybe share a transmission grid infrastructure, use larger turbines, you could drive down the cost somewhat. It's still going to be <coughs> a lot more expensive, but you know, less so than what we're looking at now. Professor? Uh, go ahead, sir. I can follow. Um, Texas has been having a lot of great success forward with clean energy, and especially with the increase of transmission lines to carry it from way out in West Texas to the rest of the state. And as one of your slides showed, the cost of land wind energy is about eight cents a kilowatt. And so why are the, uh, I just don't know that much about offshore wind, so why is it drastically more expensive? 
Is that true with your plan as well? It just seems yes, so they're, they're, your PPAs are, I think, 24 cents per kilowatt hour. I don't know if they have an increase. But, I mean, it's basically the cost of building offshore, the lack of a supply chain. You talked about service vessels. There's no installation vessel at, at this point. Um, all the questions, I think, about the Jones Act. Can you use something from another area? The cost of so operations and maintenance. The, okay, so it's more to do with the capital costs. Yes. So, so yes. So, for example, for Cape Wind, you know, if this means anything to you, it's a 2.6 billion dollar project to build. Um, you know, you have steel prices that are expensive, but just the whole concept of going offshore, you know, adds that much expense to it. Ends up being about triple land-based wind. Mm -hmm. Okay. And okay. even bringing in, in fact, this Good. slide shows it, the transmission lines. You know, the red line that Audra has on hers is our transmission line to the mainland. I mean, just installing that. Uh, first of its kind in that area is dramatic. In fact, Block Island has never been hooked up to the mainland. This is this is kind of the opposite story. That's Block the cost. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I was wondering so, if you were going to mention yeah. that. Yeah, Block Island's going to go through a golden period. Block Island has never had a connection to the mainland. So it gets all of its utility uh, electricity from diesel. diesel on the island. It's a nightmare. I mean, talk about the pollution issues associated with that. And it's some of the most expensive <coughs> electricity in the entire country. So deep water is going to feed, and it's not shown on here yet, deep water is about three miles off the southeast coast of Block Island. So deep water is going to run a transmission cable into um, um, so the wind farm will be about here, and we're going to run a line into Block Island, <coughs> Block Island for the first time, get them off their diesel. They'll have some diesel as backup, but that's expensive. Um, but Block Island's electrical rates will go way down. They're the ones who are going to like really benefit a lot from that, and then we're going to build the cable into the mainland. I mean, some of the other things, and when you're when you're a developer doing something for the first time, you better be smart about how you deal with your communities. One of the other things that Deep Water and others are doing with that red line going into the mainland is finally putting in fiber optics to get to Block Island. And it wasn't the community who was saying, oh, we want to get on Amazon and buy stuff. It was police and fire in the hospital going, we have, you know, in the summer with all these crazy people on mopeds, we're constantly responding to, like, really serious medical emergencies. <coughs> We can't get this tourist information from New York about their medical condition fast enough. So, you know, certain things are certainly going to improve the communities and make them safer in many ways as an ancillary benefit of the wind farm going in. I think we've got a couple of more minutes, I think. Yes, sir. In terms of offshore in federal waters, when does something become a major federal action to require an investment? Is it project by project approved by DOI, or would it be one of these zoning plans? How do you, the earlier in the process you can get access to the, the, the zoning decisions, the better off. And so I wonder whether those are final agency action and whether or not NEPA would apply here. Not to the project, but to the plan, to the zone. This is a good zone. To a federal zone, you're saying? To a federal zone. Yeah, I think that I'm pretty sure they all had um, not EISs but EAs. Yeah, that sounds pallid if you are if you're looking at application. It seems to me the zoning is everything. It's like on land, it's, it's the decision. After the zone, I mean, you're talking about you know <coughs> pavement green. It, 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 uh, it, it, it almost sets up a rebuttable presumption, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it seems to me, for example, if you're worried about avian impacts, the time to fill that in is at the zoning. Area. It's uh, during, you know, it's a typical, it's a rulemaking process. So it's exactly. Oh, that. it is a rulemaking. Oh yeah, in Rhode Island, it was a rulemaking process under the state APA. Right, and in interiors, it's a rulemaking process. Oh, I understood interior was going out. You're asking the non-lawyer in the room. The local, but you know looking at this study, that study, but it wasn't a formal, by rulemaking, we don't mean just setting rules, we make making a, a formal agency decision, that's called rulemaking. And so, do you 
know whether the feds are approaching this as rulemaking or just sort of studies we're doing? No, I thought it was rulemaking. I mean, again, I'll give you the pieces I know, and you can make the conclusion. I know, I know they had a notice in the public in the federal register. They okay. put it out for public yeah. comment. Does that constitute yeah, rulemaking? That like okay, it. Yeah. that's what I thought, but I wasn't. And, the, and they're presently accompanied by EA. Yes. Okay. Yes. Which are mini reviews, not very detailed. An environmental assessment instead of a environmental mm -hmm. uh, yeah. statement. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any other questions for the panel? Yeah, I got one for you to hear. This is a down and clean. <laughs> Why would a deep, a deep ocean, a, uh, a, a deep offshore <coughs> wind vessel be treated any differently from a deep, uh, uh, a deep drill, an offshore drill, drilling platform? Why would why would a wind platform be treated any differently as a vessel than a petroleum platform? Uh, it, it, it probably shouldn't matter. Um, it, it, you know, one of the, one of the dividing lines that, that matters is the state or federal waters. No, but we're in federal waters. And now we're in federal waters. Um, and and it, the questions that would be asked are, you know, is the thing going to be more or less permanently moored in one place or will it be moved from you know, seasonally, will it go to different places? Will it come in to shore uh, for maintenance and that sort of thing? The transportation element of it would trigger things like Jones Act, which governs the transportation of merchandise or people from place to place. Uh, theoretically, uh, I believe a, a deep water, federal water floating wind turbine, uh, however it's financed, could be a foreign flag vessel. It wouldn't necessarily need to be U.S. flagged under the Jones Act because it's not. But it, 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 well, it might be, and that's the that's the question that was kind of thrown into so in my my uh, outline, the Lozman case, where the Supreme Court of the United States uh, gave new guidance in air quotes about what's a vessel. But that's a there's a very interesting paper that was just published in our right here at Tulane in the Tulane Maritime Law Journal about uh, financing and flagging floating offshore turbines. So uh, if you're interested in that, uh, there's a very thoughtful analysis by, uh, uh, in the winter edition of the Maritime Law Journal. Good. Well, good. I think we're out of time. Thank you all very much. <laughs>